How do, ooh. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Our session chair seems to be um, slightly missing in action. So we're just going to moderate ourselves. I think the flight is probably delayed. <laughs> I think their flight was delayed. <laughs> oh, is it? Hello. Testing. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, good. Can you all hear me clearly? Yes. Say hi. <laughs> nice to uh, thank you all for coming to this session. Um, my name is Leora Pele, and I'm going to be um, uh, presenting on the consequence of the growing anti-rights movement across Africa and the effect that that has on HIV prevention and sexual and reproductive health. Um, you go ahead and I will just read that one. Okay, let's get started. Can you change the slide? Thank you. So, Frontline AIDS um, is a global partnership of HIV organizations across, uh, across the world, and we've recently conducted research um, around the anti-rights movement and the growth of this movement across Africa. And what we've seen is that over the last 15 years, a transnational counter-movement has been steadily developing advocacy against <laughs> sexual and reproductive health for youth, um, key populations, particularly LGBT communities, and against comprehensive sexuality education, and just generally the rights of young people to access services. We see that it's most active across Africa. We know that it is across other parts of the world, but it's really, really active in Africa, and it's growing momentum. It's really well-funded, particularly from the US. We see a very right-wing Christian funding base for the anti-rights movement, and it's really rooted in conservative views of sex as something that should only be done purely to reproduce, um, some sex should not be spoken about and that sex is something to be ashamed about but that also it's it's really strongly rooted in heterosexuality heteronormative um, messaging patriarchy and really really inflexible harmful gender norms we also see that this movement because it's so well funded has a really strong communication strategy um, and they have a really strong and emotional narrative and messaging that they use to get people to believe their, their narrative, essentially, largely around protecting the family, protecting children, protecting parental rights, and protecting tradition and society. So we see this playing out in multiple ways, and I'm going to go into specific, two specific issues that we think are really, really under attack and, um, and the effects that the anti-rights movement is having on these areas. Next slide. So the first one is the, the, the really strong movement we're seeing across Africa against homosexuality and LGBT communities. And we see this most strongly played out now in Uganda with the Anti-Homosexuality Act having um, being imposed, which has resulted in the death penalty for same-sex acts and requires Ugandans to report LGBTQ people to the police. But it also criminalizes the promotion of homosexuality, impacting civil society organizations in Uganda that may work with other key populations, because we must remember that key populations are not in isolation, there's intersectionality. And so it's jeopardizing work that civil society is doing in these countries um, with other key populations um, and under the premise that they're promoting homosexuality, directly affecting access to HIV prevention and sexual reproductive health services and derailing progress that has been made over many, many years. And what we see is that this, this is moving across Africa. We see similar legislation tabled in Ghana, Senegal and Kenya. We see increasing human rights violations in multiple East African countries like Tanzania and Kenya against LGBT communities. It's even starting to move down into Southern Africa. 
And uh, Burundi is also a country where there's been a spike in human rights violations and stigma and discrimination of LGBT communities. And this is largely because of the, the work that the anti-rights movement has done over the last 15 years to spread misinformation around LGBT communities and homosexuality. Next slide. So before I speak about the impact that the rights movement, the anti-rights movement has had on comprehensive sexuality, it's just important to stop and think about the fact that young people in Africa face many challenges related to HIV prevention and sexual and reproductive health. There's high HIV prevalence, there's high numbers of unintended pregnancy. In Africa, we have 3,100 adolescent girls and young women being infected with HIV every week. There's low access to testing and low access to contraception, and even condoms can be a problem to access. And so we know that comprehensive sexuality is a critical part of HIV prevention for youth in Africa because it provides tools and information to allow young people to protect themselves, to understand how to protect themselves, and to understand when their rights are being violated. It empowers youth to make decisions, um, and it also um, creates and promotes safe and equitable learning environments by explaining how gender norms create inequality and build understanding of how stigma and discrimination can ne negatively affect health. So comprehensive sexuality also really changes the narrative around sex, which the anti-rights movement has tried to make around shame and something that's not spoken about. And it tries to change that narrative around sex um, from being shameful and negative, um, but as actually something that is happening and part of every day and something that we need to speak about. Next slide, please. So what we've seen is that the anti-rights movement has actually had a massive, massive impact on comprehensive sexuality. Um, because these, these movements um, are really tied to right-wing Christian, um, US and European-based campaigning organizations like Family Watch, International Citizen Go, um, for example, um, they developed a really, really, really strong campaign called the Stop CSE Campaign. And they basically, their messaging labeled CSE as something that's sexualizing children, promoting promiscuity, uh, challenges uh, anything that goes against patriarchy. This, uh, this campaign was incredibly strong around promoting a heteronormative family um, where children under the age of 18 don't even think or talk about sex. Um, and they, they claimed that CSE threatened the family and threatened marriage, and was essentially threatening African society and destroying tradition in African society. One of their big messaging um, campaigns within the Stop CSE campaign and against CSE is that it denies parental rights. And so a lot of their messaging is around protect the child and protect the parental rights. But unfortunately, we know that young people are having sex. So we either protect them and provide them with tools and information or we don't. Um, but unfortunately, this campaign was so successful that they actually, um, and they launched just before the renewal of the Eastern and Southern Africa commitment um, in 2021. And they were so successful with this campaign that many countries that had signed up to the ESA commitment before did not renew their commitment. So you could see how this misinformation campaign and this really clever communication strategy had filtered into all parts of society, making parents scared of comprehensive sexuality education and promoting it as something that would destroy the values of society and create promiscuity amongst youth. Next slide. So some of the tactics we see um, the anti-rights groups uh, using is that they leverage critical milestones and moments. So when there's an election in a country or there's a revision of guidelines, they, they tag onto that and they, and they use it. Um, and they use it really successfully. The Stop uh, CSE campaign was launched just before the renewal of the ESA commitment, and they very successfully managed to derail that. 
They also change stakeholder dynamics. So they capitalize on the development of new guidelines, curricula, materials. They also have um, really good networks and they are really well connected within governments. Um, and they host huge meetings across the continent where they bring politicians to, you know, really nice hotels and have a meeting and they sort of change um, the views of politicians. And so they change the dynamics entirely. And what you see then is that stakeholders who previously may have been supportive of CSC or LGBT communities and providing youth with services, they suddenly flip after being involved with these movements. They also, they also utilize confusion about terminology. I'm sure everyone in the room is really aware about the fact that United Nations documents now often cannot have the word sexual and reproductive health in it. It gets struck out. There can't be words around rights um, in that. And that is because of the successful narratives and communication of these anti-rights groups. So they often use different terminology um, particularly around co like comprehensive sexuality, for example, the word comprehensive being considered quite difficult or um, concerning because it 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 is seen to include um, sort of everything and and can often be conflated with promoting homosexuality as well. And then they're really good at campaigns and developing policy briefs, et cetera. So as I explained, they have a really strong communication strategy. And they've, the, the Stop CSE campaign is a, is a perfect example of a really strong, well-funded communications te team and narrative um, that included policy briefs, websites, um, and every type of you know, thing that, um, that would be done by a really well-funded, well-organized campaign. Next slide. So what does this mean for us at ICASA and what does this mean for HIV prevention? What it means is that LGBTQ communities across Africa are facing increased uh, criminalization, stigma and discrimination, and by consequence, human rights violations. We know that criminalization fuels stigma and stigma fuels criminalization, which results in human rights violations for these communities but actually completely undermines the progress we've made in getting them access to HIV prevention and sexual reproductive health services. Young people across Africa are being denied access to information and comprehensive sexuality around how to protect themselves, what is HIV, what is sexual and reproductive health, and by consequence, they are being denied access to services. Often we've also seen that a lot of this information and backlash against comprehensive sexuality also translates into a lack of, um, into a campaign against young people having access to contraception, HIV testing, and condoms in schools. Um, and so we still see, as I said, 3,100 girls a week becoming infected with HIV. We still see huge amounts of pregnancies, unintended pregnancies, and unsafe abortions across the continent. So it's derailing a lot of the efforts that um, you know, people in this conference are doing to provide services to these groups. And then we also see um, these, the anti-rights movement now really campaigning against PrEP and new prevention technologies, particularly to our most at-risk groups like adolescent girls and young women, and then, of course, to LGBT communities. So really having a direct um, effect on our ability to stop new infections. Next slide. So how do we fight back? What we've seen from the Stop CSE campaign and the work that these movements have done is that we need to be ready. They are very well funded and very well organized and have a lot of capacity. And so we need to get ready. The tsunamis come quickly and we need to build alliances come together across NAC, across government, across civil society, community networks. We need to involve faith and traditional leaders and we need to prepare for these threats and we need to look forward on, you know, what are upcoming um, changes in country? What are, are there upcoming elections? Are there revisions to curricula that might be happening soon? And prepare and get ready. We also need to develop a counter-narrative using facts. So facts are that young girls are getting infected with HIV. Young people are having sex and we can't change that. So we need to educate them. But also using experiences and using 
the communities themselves and feelings to counter misinformation. We need to develop a really strong communications plan. We can't, we can't not have a strong communications plan when their entire anti-rights movement is built on a really, really strong communications plan. So we need to change the narrative, and part of that is a really strong comms, comms element. We also need donors to start funding work and advocacy on countering the anti-rights movement. A lot of organizations are trying to incorporate advocacy against the movement within their programmatic work and the work they're doing in country. But when you see how well-funded and how well-organized the anti-rights movement is, we really do need donors to come and fund urgent scale-up. And then something else that needs to be considered is that there's not enough money for safety and security of communities. We saw in Uganda the number of LGBT community members that needed urgent money to support rapid response, to support safety and security relocation. And I think we're going to be seeing that a lot more across the continent. And so, again, we need a lot more investment and we need to start planning and developing systems for rapid response quickly and urgently to support those that need it. So that's everything. Thank you so much. Wow, how do I follow that? <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, can we pull up my slide, please? Um, good, is, oh yeah, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. Wow, it's such, I didn't expect anyone to show up, but you all did. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Temi Oki. I am um, the director of evaluation for a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. called House Helping Us. But I also do research um, in Nigeria. So I'm originally from Nigeria, but I live in the United States now. So my research focus on exploring health disparities among um, sexual and gender minority population, including men who are sex with men and transgender individuals. Uh, do we have a slide up, please? So um, today I will be presenting on a research. Um, so actually, that's a, that's a really good segue to the information that you provided in terms of the criminalization of LGBTQ individuals in Africa and how that impacts access to services. Um, and one of the population that is currently being understudied, uh, transgender individuals. So when I was living in Nigeria years ago, I mean, we didn't have that many visibility of trans individuals. So recently, you know, I was here, no, we have trans individuals in Nigeria. I was like, wait a minute, that's not true. When I was there, there was nobody really coming out, you know, that they're trans identified. So in 2001, um, a friend of mine that, who is also trans that lives in Canada, you know, informed me that um, she's having a beauty pageant for trans-identified individuals in Nigeria. And I was like, wait a minute, are you serious about that? She said, yes, I said, okay, wait a minute, you know what, I'm gonna come around and we can do a study to create awareness around, you know, visibility and issues that transgender individuals face. So this is part of the, um, uh, of the domains that we explore during the study. So today I'm gonna be talking about the facilitators and barriers to gender or family health care and HIV services, you know, an exploratory study among transgender individuals in Nigeria. So thanks for listening to my TED talk. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background for many of you that have not been to Nigeria, but you've heard about Nigeria, I promise you, we are not all fraudsters, okay? We are not all scammers. <laughs> but Nigeria is situated, of course, in West Africa. It is the most populous country in Africa, the sixth most populous in the world, you know, over 202, oh, sorry, excuse me, 225 million people, major tribes, Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba. I belong to the Yoruba tribe, and we are the best. <laughs> but of course, there's over 500 languages spoken. Our official language is English, and you know, capital is in Abuja. The largest city, of course, is Lagos. Next slide. So a little bit, um, you know, background, you know, which is similar to what um, you just shared, and thanks for that um, useful information. But the key thing you can see from this slide is that we already, like, same sex is already criminalized in Nigeria. You know, there's a draconian law, 
But in 2014, the former president, Goodluck Jonathan, went ahead and still signed, you know, into law the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, which further criminalizes same-sex relationships. So if you are a member of the LGBTQ community, you are liable to 14 years imprisonment. If you are a, you know, if you're a family member of someone that belongs to the community, you're a mother, a father, a brother, sister, you know, whatever, and you refuse to report, you know, someone in your family that's a member of the LGBT community, darling, you are going to 10 years in prison. Right, absolutely. So again, this is like, with the amount of issues that's going on in that country, unfortunately, this is one of the things that the government felt like they need to focus on. But these are the background to some of the issues that the community um, face. Next slide. Ooh. All right. Oh, wait, you were jumping real fast. Um, all right. Previous slide. Previous one. All right. Oh, what? Next. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for that. All right. So again, so the study background. So as I said earlier, I seized the opportunity for a beauty pageant that was going on in Nigeria to quickly do a study. Luckily, I have a reliable ROB entity that was able to approve the ROB. So globally, trans identified you know, individuals, they continue to face persistent discrimination, regardless of where they are in the world. Now, we do know that several scientific studies you know, on sexual and gender minority populations mostly focus on men who have sex with men. But we do also have trans individuals. Unfortunately, they are usually lumped you know, with men who have sex with men, and they need to be separated because that's how we can voice, you know, their issues. So empirical research that centers on the lived experiences of trans individuals in Nigeria is lacking, and particularly on their gender transition process, as well as targeted HIV um, services. So we do need such data and such information to inform the development and implementation of evidence-based um, interventions that is specific to the needs of the trans-identified population. Next slide. So the overall study was for us to understand the socio-political factors and barriers to service delivery and gender affirming care and what are some of the implications to HIV transmission, infection, and vulnerability among transgender individuals in Nigeria. Next slide. So we did focus group, you know, this is something that has not really been, you know, well explored. So it makes sense to do a qualitative study. So, you know, we recruited participants, um, you know, through community-based organizations in Abuja and Lagos. And as I said, um, there was a, a friend of mine in Canada that went to Nigeria to implement a beauty project in collaboration with some CBOs in Abuja and Lagos. So we conducted three group uh, interviews. Two was in Abuja, which is a federal capital city, and one was in Lagos. So all of the FGDs were digitally recorded, and each lasted um, about one point, you know, one hour, 30 minutes. But I do promise you the very first focus group actually lasted almost three hours because the participants were just willing to share their experience. And there was a lot of trauma going on that they wanted to share. So my background is I'm a social worker by training. So I actually had to turn from a researcher to being a counselor at that point because everybody was just emotional and they needed time to process their feelings. So participants, of course, were compensated um, for their time and effort. And for our interview guide, we look at these different domains. We look at their lived experiences, the stigma and discrimination and violence that they face as members of the key population. We look at gender affirming care, like what does that mean? The HIV services, what other healthcare services are available, as well as what social support um, have they received? For data analysis, we did a thematic content analysis. So all of the participant responses were transcribed verbatim and assigned into descriptive um, coding. And we also collected demographic information that we ran a descriptive analysis on. Now, if I'm moving too fast, please tell me to slow down. All right, so this is the result uh, for the demographic. So in total, we had 25 trans-identified individuals that participated in the focus group discussion. Um, and um, so in Abuja, we did two focus group and that yielded 20 people. And in Lagos, we had one focus group with five individuals that attended. Now, 52% reported age younger than 25. So you can imagine there are more younger people that actually identified as trans. Um, and 36 people were between age 26 and 35. So again, if you look at this, this is what? almost, what, 88% of the individuals belong to the age spectrum of lower than 
um, 35 years. Majority, of course, 80% identified as transgender women. I actually was surprised to see two, you know, individuals that um, identified as trans men, and because I wasn't expecting to even see them, but they actually showed up for the focus group, and that provided a different perspective um, to the experience. So 76% had attained an education at, a, at or above secondary education. As many of you already know, we Nigerians, we love to go to school. So 36% <laughs> so had completed university education, 20% some university education, and about 20% also completed some secondary education. Now, the interesting thing is, despite this educational level amongst the population, right most of them have a monthly income of about a hundred dollars monthly like that's really low despite their educational um, background 40 percent of them were employed they're looking for work and 24 percent were working part-time 68 percent reported being single and 24 percent reported on stable housing with some residing in lgbtq uh, safe housing now i'm going to go into the demo uh, the qualitative um findings from our study um, as I said earlier, we had the different domains. So this particular presentation is focusing more on the gender affirming care and HIV healthcare services that is either available or not available to trans identify individuals. So as you can see from our study, our findings shows that there's a widespread lack of access to quality gender affirming care, particularly hormone and surgical services for transition. Several of the participants are actually forced to self-medicate without any prescription from any provider. The participant described advanced you know, experiences within healthcare settings, even within LGBTQ-focused organizations in Nigeria. And that's mostly because many of us, you know, the providers are not trans competent. I have, I, some of them have no clue of really what to do and how to provide services to trans-identified individuals. There are limited trans-specific HIV prevention, treatment, and care services. Almost all of the available services, HIV services in Nigeria are focused on men who are sex with men when it comes to key population and, of course, sex workers. So transgender individuals are lumped with men who have sex with men. And that also further, you know, suppresses their needs. Now, you know, other barriers, as I've mentioned earlier, there are, there's a lack of trans competent healthcare providers, fewer organizations that focus on their specific needs, and more importantly, there's limited access to evidence-based scientific information on the safety of gender-affirming care, especially for those that may be living with HIV. Many of them have no idea of what, you know, the side effects of the medication they're using. And as I said earlier, many of them don't have prescription from any medical provider. They mostly self-medicate when they start the transition process. Now, these are some of the quotes um, from the, um, you know, from our findings, and I will read them. So participant one from FGD1 said, I have challenges because with taking hormone pills, with the research I did online, you can't just place yourself on hormone pills yourself. You have to, there is a protocol like a consultant that you need to talk to because they will have to check your liver and your kidney. Another participant said, the fact that Nigeria is transphobic, you can't walk up to a doctor and say, I'm a trans person. I really need this kind of drug. Prescribe this drug for me. Even if the pharmacy we even go to, if you are buying pro progesterone or any hormone drug, they will be looking at you. Another participant said, when I want to set transition and when I go to some pharmacy, the, 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 so the chief pharmacy said this, huh, testosterone blockers, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm a trans. I just opened up and told her. So buying it there, they know me. The moment I get there, they tell me your stuff is available. Even if it's not available, that I should come back in three days. Now, this is another quote on HIV and healthcare services. The participant said, as a trans-identified person, zero, meaning healthcare centers, but for MSM, men who are serving men, there are abundance of healthcare services and all of that. But as a trans-identified person, for me, personally, zero. Another participant said, if I wanted to get healthcare services, I just claim to be a gay man, which is cringe-worthy to begin with, because that's not who they are. That's not who they identify with. Another participant said, I have been to an organization where a fellow community member told me, all these things you keep doing, are you not tired? Your hair, lashes, wig, the way you dress. I kept telling this person, he's an MSM, 
and I'm a trans person, there is a total difference. I'm a woman, you sh don't compare yourself to me. These facilities uh, just focus on MSM and HIV testing. So these are direct quotes from uh, qualitative findings. So of course, there's no study without limitations, right? So recruitment bias, again, I seize the opportunity of a beauty pageant that was happening to do this focus group discussion. So this was a convenience sampling and may not be as representative as we would have loved it to be. Also, majority of the participants identified as transgender women, which was 80%, and we had 20% trans men. Recall bias was also a you know, sort of limitation, and it was a potential for re-traumatization for, for many you know, participants. As I said, I actually became a counselor during the focus group because many of them were re-traumatized from the experience of violence and discrimination that they faced in Nigeria. Focus group, of course, you know, compared to one-on-one -on -one in depth interview, because it was a group discussion, there's, you know, I can, as a researcher, I can't vouch for um percent confidentiality. So some participants may not feel comfortable um, to fully express themselves. But in conclusion, and despite those limitations, overall, you know, our findings review that transgender individuals experience multiple barriers to you know access to gender affirming care, which is not available in Nigeria, as most of them are, you know, are currently self-medicating. And also targeted HIV prevention are mostly, you know, lumped with men who access with men programs. Healthcare center, particularly LGBTQ organizations, lack the competency and the resources to necessarily provide adequate services to this population. Therefore, you know, multi-level interventions and approaches are needed for us to be able to address the barriers and improve access to quality gender affirming healthcare services for trans individuals in Nigeria. And I believe, oh, next slide. Yes, so I just want to acknowledge the organization where I work at as, you know, as a research scientist, the participants, the agency that helped with the recruitment, and that's the, uh, the school that I graduated from recently uh, with my doctorate in social work. And this is the uh, picture that we took during the focus group. So as you can see, this wasn't something that was made up. This actually happened. If you look in the picture that, oh, next slide, sorry. Yes, so that's the picture that we took and that's me right there. Ain't they beautiful? See that? <laughs> All right, so thanks for listening to our TED Talk. So I think we can, um, next slide, I think that's my contact uh, information. So I think questions, uh, I believe, so if you have questions for myself and uh, my, and Lior, yeah. yes, thank you. <laughs> questions, comments, suggestions, I see a hand, okay. All right, yes. Yeah. Do we have a mic or? Oh. Okay. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Bongo. on SRH and especially HIV infections. Mm -hmm. When we drop numbers and we say 3,000 new infections, mm -hmm. we know very much the statistics on women, we know the unplanned pregnancies, we know all those statistics, but we're missing a very gray area when we talk about men. Mm -hmm. Who are infecting these young women? Mm -hmm. When we talk about, where I'm from Johannesburg, where the youngest mother is nine years old, right? Mm -hmm. I'm from South Africa, where from those 3,000 new infections, 1.4 of them happen to us every week. And many times interventions, um, conversations, conferences, I'm missing the element. Where are the programs for the young men? Mm. Where are the programs that teach young men to be humans, to see other people mm -hmm. as you know, human beings and reduce sexual violence? So I think to get ready, when you mm. say, how do we get ready? We need to start, in, and I see also in the audience, there's mostly men, Right. right? So we are being studied, we are being researched, we are numbers, but we're not seeing the missing picture of what the male, even when we talk about patriarchy and we talk about all these religious movements, mm -hmm. they are mostly what? Led by men. Where are they? Why are we not giving them a platform? Why are we not training young boys from a young age as well? Mm -hmm. So that we humanize them, so that they learn, us as women, what does sexual violence mean? Mm -hmm. How does it affect relationships? So right now, 
we're just fixing and dealing with the victim and we're missing a huge part of the demographic that is mainly the cause. So I think just to also challenge Ikasa, we want to see more about young men programs. Mm -hmm. We want to see more what is currently happening there, what are their challenges. And within the private sector as well, we know that mining companies and mining communities, they're the big perpetrators. We know about construction companies and the babies that they leave as they travel from community to community. And most of the time when we talk, we talk about funding, we talk about programs of condoms, but we don't talk about capacitating the boy child mm -hmm. or the men. Mm -hmm. Right? So for me, that is the ask to say, when we say we get ready, I would have loved to see these seats filled by men organization, men who are challenging the status quo, mm -hmm. men who are in support or against human rights violations, because mm -hmm. we can't do it alone. <laughs> Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Judy McCauley. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, for both of you, um, in your presentation, you spoke about the challenges that LGBT people are facing in Africa, and um, and talk about more in particular, or tell me <laughs> more in particular, um, you know, the work that you did and the research in transgender people in Nigeria. Now, to both of you, um, how can the faith communities? And mm. I know this is controversial from my friend here. Right. Uh, how can the faith community begin to realize the impact of conservatism mm -hmm. and you know bad theology and mistranslation of scripture on the LGBT community? And also, is there any possibility or a dream that LGBT people can also train for ministry like I have? I'm also a member of the key, key, key population right. for everyone to know, just in case they want to talk to me later. How, how do you think this is possible? And also and I think that research is very important yes. because mm -hmm. without the data, we don't know. Right. Now, in the research that you did, was there and, and the impromptu counseling mm -hmm. that took place, mm -hmm. did you have to go to church with the people or do you have to go to the temple with them? What right. happened? And yeah. also to you, uh, my right. friend as well, what is Frontline uh, is focusing on? Are they focusing on the impact of um, mm -hmm. faith on people? Because you cannot separate LGBT people from mm -hmm. their religious beliefs. Absolutely. It's just so important. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to stop? Yeah, me, I can, I can say that. Um, great question. Thanks for that. And thanks for your comment um, as well. And more comment slash question. Um, I think I can respond to both um, a, a little bit. Um, yes, I unrepresent agree with you that we definitely need to start focusing on men. And I think one of the things, at least from my experience being in the US and why so there are a few organizations that currently do programs with heterosexual men. And we found that there's a lot of men everywhere in the world, actually, regardless of where you are, that are on the down low. And that's why we, you know, there's a lot of focus on men who are sex with men and not necessarily, again, it's a public health terminology. It's not a sexual orientation, whether you're gay or bisexual. Men who are sex with men is a public health terminology because we do have men that will not necessarily identify as being gay or bisexual. So those programs still focus on them. And these are men that are either married or have girlfriends, especially if you find yourself in an African home or in an African continent, you are still forced to have relationship with, with the opposite sex. So that further drives transmission. But I do 100% agree that we need to have programs that also focus on heterosexual men, starting from the young age of 9, 12, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, and to your question, um, Reverend Judith, thanks for that. Um, I think it's critical that we need to continue to incorporate and integrate spirituality and sexuality and how that influence HIV prevention. Because believe you me, many of the LGBTQ population in, you know, in, in, in Africa, in the U.S., we all belong to some sort of religion. And we all sometimes also find solace in that religion. I mean, I'm a Christian myself. I grew up in the church. I sing in the choir. I'm a praise leader, right? <laughs> and it took me time to really reconcile my spirituality and my sexuality as a gay man. Now, that's not always, you know, the same when you find yourself living in a country that is very homophobic and that is also very hypocritical, like a place like Nigeria. So... I, I hate to say this, I'm cautiously optimistic. It's possible for us to be able to have religious organizations for them to start influencing the narrative 
it is possible. It is not impossible, but it's going to take a lot of work for us to get to where, you know, you would want us to be. If we have organizations or institutions and religious institutions like you have and continue to train younger people and see how I know when I was in Nigeria, one of the things. So the narrative that I usually paint when I do some of the sensitization training is I draw a, you know, a, a picture especially when we go to hospitals and we're talking about HIV prevention with, you know, mostly nurses and doctors that are women. And I draw a picture and I was like, okay, this is a man and heterosexual, you know, in, in quotes, man, right? And this man is married, right? Right? And he's also on the download, right? And this man, because he's married, probably has some other girlfriend somewhere that is having sexual relationship with. This girlfriend probably has somebody that she's dating or that she's about to get married to. And you can see how the pattern keeps spreading. Now, this man that is in the whole picture is probably on the down low and sleeping with men and probably not using protection. So if he's HIV infected, he's going to be transmitting the HIV. So that's the kind of picture that I paint for people to really understand. So in the religious setting too, I think that's something that we can continue to push more so on the public health standpoint, because most of them think that we're pushing the gay agenda for them to get married. Let's leave that aside for now. Let's talk about HIV prevention and public health. Um, uh, they're flagging that we have two minutes left, but I just want to add two things. Um, I also come from South Africa, so I know what you're talking about firsthand. Um, and I think that uh, I can see that there are some efforts to include the young boys, um, like, for example, the Global Fund programs now are adolescent 